nice to see all of you here. And uh, some of you may have heard some of what I'm going to say. And um, in some ways, it's a good flow from Harriet. I, I want to start by um, <laughs> suggesting that um, I am increasingly finding the distinction between primary prevention and everything else not that helpful in, in the field. And while I totally uh, agree with Rachel's statement yesterday that we really need to put a strong emphasis on primary prevention, I think we need to see prevention as a continuum. And as Harriet quite eloquently said, you know, a lot of uh, services for women who are already in violent relationships can operate in different ways as primary prevention, particularly around the identification of children who are exposed, but also in terms of preventing recurrence dealing with some of the mental health consequences which then have implications for early childhood development, etc. So I think it's important not to see them as an either or, but really think of prevention as a continuum. And that's just something that I'm seeing because I f find more and more that, you know, sort of the pendulum swings. And, and now, you know, all, all the donors want to hear is primary prevention and anything to do with health services is like not prevention. And so, I think we have to, to get that balance right and learn from the experience of HIV that the pendulum has to be in the middle and both things are necessary and important. Um, I'm going to focus a lot of what I'm going to say on intimate partner violence because I was trying to think of the question that Manuel posed to all of us, you know, can we reduce by 30% in, 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 uh, to in 30 years and, and what the reason for focusing on partner violence is partly because this is where we have the most data and where it's possible to, to look at the data across. Um, I think also because in a way it's where it all starts. I mean, that's the, the families where the norms and behaviors uh, get shaped. And so it, it, there are also a lot of synergies with other forms of violence if we address partner violence. And then as uh, Rachel showed this graph, this is an analysis from the WHO multi-country study, and the, f the circles are proportionate to, to size. So, and, and so that shows very clearly that the big circle, which is, there's supposed to be different colors, but it doesn't seem to show here, it does show on the screen. Uh, so the large circle is intimate partner violence, the circle on the left is child sexual abuse, and the circle on the, sorry, on the right is child sexual abuse, and on the left is, um, uh, sexual abuse after age 15 uh, and so we see there are overlaps but there are, you know they're not there, there are a lot of women who have partner violence who did not have child abuse and who are not experienced other forms of sexual abuse so just to keep in mind that there are overlaps but they're also uh, you know they, they are not completely overlapping those circles um, I think ev everybody's used this slide, so I'm not going to bore you with, with it, but I think just to emphasize it, we also know, um, know more, although R Rachel made the point yesterday in that what we know largely is from cross-sectional studies, it's about associations. Uh, so there's a lot of limitations in our understanding of risk factors and particularly in our understanding of the interlinkages and the interactions between factors at all the different levels. And one important point is to s that the factors that are important to increase or decrease risk at the individual level are not necessarily the same as those that are relevant at the population level. So we may need to address a whole range of individual factors that are important for those individuals but may not help us to shift the overall curve and address the sort of 30% uh, reduction in 50% reduction in, in, in uh, 30 years. And I'm going to very briefly mention an analysis that our colleague Lori Heise has been working on, um, where she tried to, because a lot of, the, of what we, we know has focused on the individual risk factors, you know, the risk of having witnessed, the risk of uh, related to being exposed to abuse, uh, drinking patterns, etc., and less on the macro level and how these factors are related to the prevalence. So she's been looking, she's been doing an analysis using 40 DHS and WHO studies um, and looking at the relationship between the prevalence of physical and sexual partner violence and some of these more macro level variables, particularly those that are related to gender inequality. Everything from uh, loss, uh, um, 
no social norms around acceptability of violence, male control, and uh, economic factors. And that, that, that research will be published very shortly uh, in uh, Lancet Global Health. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not going to go into the details, but just to flag that from her analysis, the factors that really came out, this is from the bivariate analysis, that came out as really most important uh, and, um, and stayed uh, you know, significant at the multivariate uh, level were the participation in formal wage labor, so the participation of women in formal wage labor and issues around norms, norms approving wife feeding, which we saw from Manuel's study from a man yesterday is you know, very similar to what we find in many countries. And, and norms around male control of, of female behavior. Some of the other factors like GDP and uh, inequality in ownership um, did not remain significant after at the multivariate uh, level. And so a little bit based on that analysis, uh, I'm, I'm just gonna go through some of the evidence that we have around what are some of those macro level factors and uh, other factors that we might help us to achieve this reduction of 50%. Recognizing, as, uh, as was said by Rachel and I think many other uh, presentations this morning emphasize that, you know, at the moment, all that we, our studies are all around one factor. So we have an RCT looking at, you know, this or that, but really what we know from all our, our understanding and our better understanding of the ecological model, et cetera, is that it's this multiplicity and this kind of web of factors that is, you know, helping to increase or decrease, that is contributing to increasing or decreasing the prevalence. And so we need much more complex, much more multiple interventions, which we know are, are challenging. But, um, yeah, so, so I'm going to go through each of those five issues, the social norms, the women's economic and social empowerment, childhood exposure, harmful alcohol use, and legal injustice, and just briefly go through some of the evidence and a lot this is largely based on Laurie's review of 2011 which she did for DFID which was in the first slide and the WHO uh, London School review of what works to reduce uh, to prevent intimate partner and sexual violence from 2010 both were attempts to kind of look at what do we know what how well how what does looking at all the evidence together tell us uh, some of it is based on evidence, um, you know, of RCTs, like, although as Harriet mentioned, there's really very little that comes out with strong enough evidence to say this is what you should do. But there's a lot of also promising, um, you know, interventions, some of them with one RCT in one country, but that uh, merits further study and further um, adaptation and elaboration. So starting with the, norma, with the social norms, I think that there is uh, quite strong evidence on the link between the acceptability of violence. Uh, these questions that Manuel showed yesterday, you know, do you think it's acceptable for a wife for, to be beaten by her husband if X, Y, Z, which has been used in a lot of the DHS studies and in the WHO studies, they all come very closely associated with and even though there's a lot of questions about what do you mean by social norms and how do you measure and what are we really capturing, the, the, there is an association there, uh, and there, is, there are um, examples showing that when the social norms change, the prevalence also changes. And uh, I was thinking it would be quite interesting to do a historical analysis like Manuel did for homicide, you know, in Europe, for example, or other countries looking historically at these changes because we know that domestic violence has been decreasing in Western Europe in in the US and look at how that relates with some of these uh, social norms but uh, and th there are some promising interventions some more promising than others I mean there's been a lot of emphasis on these awareness raising campaigns and I think the verdict is out as to whether they really do serve you know to change behavior certainly there's no evidence that they change behavior there is some evidence that they may change attitudes and maybe, you know, accept social ideas around the acceptability. Uh, some of them, like the Oxfam one that we can campaign, is not just about raising awareness, but it's also identifying uh, change agents and m people in the field who will be uh, motivators for change. 
Others are more just like posters and media, and I think uh, there's a need to really get a better understanding of what, what, is, what are the elements that make them work. Small group uh, transformational change efforts. We have Stepping Stones, that is the one that has been best evaluated with an RCT. Um, programs like uh, Soul City and in, in South Africa and Sexto Sentido in Nicaragua, which are the ones that have been most evaluated, which use a combination of education, entertainment, peer groups, etc. And again, um, particularly Sexto Sentido was very much targeted at young people and trying to really focus on, on, on youth. And I, I do think that, you know, as has been emphasized in the presentations, the earlier we start, the better, because we know uh, the, stu the studies, for example, in Bangladesh, India, and um, Nepal, that were looking at attitudes among 15 to 19 year old boys, showed that already half of 15 to 19 year old boys in Nepal and Bangladesh think that it's okay to beat your wife if, you know, and think that it's, uh, you know, that men have the right to sex and etc. So these attitudes already are really quite well established even by adolescents. So I think this speaks to the need to intervene early. Oh, sorry, I seem to be jumping without wanting to. Um, and then uh, more recently, uh, there's been an, an evaluation, uh, um, a cl cluster trial that Charlotte can say more about looking at program, the SASA in Uganda, which is more targeting at a community level rather than individual level uh, changes in attitudes, norms, etc., and showing some promising um, impacts. And these are just a few examples of some of those. Um, looking at the uh, women's social and economic empowerment, the evidence here is a little bit more mixed. Um, there is uh, some evidence that secondary education is protective. That seems to be pretty consistent. And I think, Bernadette, you chose that as your best, your best buy was the completion of secondary education and of good quality, etc. That certainly seems to be protective. Other things like access to employment, ownership, or cast or, at or assets have mixed. So in some situations, they seem to be protective. In other situations, they might actually increase the risk of partner violence, especially in the initial stages. So mixed evidence depending on the context and uh, some of the individual factors also may be mediated by, by other factors. So for example, there's some data from India that the protective effect of secondary education is mediated in relation to the husband's employment or to the husband's gender attitude. So a little bit more, more mixed, but the issue of access to waged employment um, you know, just something to, to keep in mind as maybe another of the big buys, you know, apart from education, access to em employment. Um, the evidence on interventions, again, is also mixed. I mean, there is evidence from one RCT in South Africa, for, uh, in a cluster trial in South Africa, that this combined uh, microfinance with a gender training uh, program, and I'm sure pro all of you here probably have heard of IMAGE, had an, uh, was able to reduce the rate of partner violence in two years. And so the, I think, attractiveness of that is that it showed that it is doable within a certain period. But of course, there were many elements that went into the program. There was the economic empowerment, there was the gender training, there was an element of community involvement, you know, work with men. So trying to, again, pull out what is the things that make uh, that make it more effective is uh, is something we need to to look at and then the challenges of scaling up because it is being scaled up now in South Africa I understand there are many challenges with the process of scaling up I don't know the details they have been able to show that scaling up reduces the costs per person quite substantially and so that's a good thing although the cost per individual is still quite high relatively to what a government uh, program could spend. Um, there's a lot of interest now in, in looking at cash transfer programs, including in humanitarian settings. It's kind of become the big fashion. Uh, and the evidence is mixed. There, there are no cash programs that have set out to reduce violence, but studies have shown in that in some cases they did reduce violence but with mixed effects. So they, you know, like in Mexico, they reduced physical violence, but not necessarily emotional violence. 
they reduced it amongst people with very high levels of violence, uh, but they didn't reduce it and it actually increased in w uh, where the husband and the woman had a big disparity in earnings. So there's a lot of variables that again we need to understand, you know, what, what is working and how is it working. Um, but and, and then how to make it last, because the, the one study that looked at it later found that the effect had not, you know, been sustained. But there's some, you know, interest in not necessarily only cash transfers, but other social protection schemes that might um, be relevant for, for addressing violence. I was going to say a little bit more about image, just because it is an interesting one, and emphasize, to emphasize that it wasn't really it wasn't only the economic empowerment, but the, the, that the analysis that they've done showed that the gender training component uh, was, you know, probably the most important. And they showed improvements in reported self-confidence, autonomy, decision making, ability to challenge social norms. Um, so the economic is important, but it's not in and of itself enough. And, and these were some of the, uh, some of the, um, the pathways through which they, uh, they believe that they contributed to the reduction of violence. So shifts in attitudes, uh, not just in the woman who was receiving the intervention, but also in the, in the, the surrounding group. Women gained income earning status and negotiating power, more uh, able to leave abusive relationships reduce conflict over finance and improve communication and conflict resolution. And I want to emphasize that last one because when we look at our risk factors, this issue of conflict, uh, marital conflict, etc., comes up quite a bit and we haven't, I don't think we've really explored that in terms of interventions. And it's just like parenting interventions, you know, I helping people to learn how to communicate better, how to resolve conflict with their partners might be, uh, you know, feasible intervention a cost-effective intervention that I don't think has been really explored in, in, in any depth and could be linked to parenting interventions, for example. Um, okay, so I'm going to speed up. Childhood exposure, I think um, Harriet elaborated that very well and we've heard about that. So I won't go into it, but I think we, we know that there is a potential link. At the same time, I really increasingly dislike this intergenerational transmission because it sounds as if it's an inevitable thing that you know it keeps on transmitting from family to family and although we know that adversities cluster in families we also know that when you look at for example boys who are exposed to part to domestic violence in their homes a third go on to become perpetrators but there are two thirds who don't go on to become perpetrators and so yes we need to look at it as a risk factor but also look at what makes those other two-thirds not become perpetrators. And, and, uh, and I think if we talk about it in that transmission, it like, sounds like this is going to happen and continue to happen. So I just, uh, anyway, that's just to be in my bonnet. <laughs> but I, I think we need to look at it. Um, uh, and one other pitch that I would make is that I think parenting programs so far have not really addressed the gender dimensions of parenting and how parenting also perpetuates stereotypes and inequality in relationships. And so I think adding that dimension of gender into parenting programs would make them even m stronger in terms of what our ultimate aim is. Harmful use of alcohol, big debate, how um, al important is alcohol or not? Clearly there are regions of the world with a lot of intimate partner violence which have very little alcohol like, you know, in our study Bangladesh or many of the Arab countries, but what the data shows quite clearly is that it is where present, it does contribute to frequency and severity of partner violence. We know that there's a range of interventions that can reduce harmful use of alcohol. We also know that the substance abuse and alcohol pro programs where both women and men come are potential places where violence could be addressed because we know there's a close linkage between those two and w by and large at this moment most alcohol and substance use programs do not even ask about violence so it's again a missed opportunity where we could make some some gains uh, very mixed evidence on whether legal and justice system interventions have any impact on prevalence but at the same time 
as was discussed yesterday, important in terms of the social message about what's acceptable. Uh, some interesting idea, uh, you know, strategies around uh, mobile courts and working with village dispute resolution systems that have been explored in some low income countries but haven't really been evaluated. Um, women police stations also have been looked at and again mixed results and really showing that they send a message about the fact that this is punishable and it's not acceptable and that's important but whether they work or not for women and whether they really help women access justice or uh, is, is still um, mixed. Um, and then pro-arrest policies, this has mainly been looked at in high income countries, it shows that it ha may have a modest effect, especially on first time domestic abusers that are not also doing a lot of other abuse. So it's, it's the low frequency, I'm gonna skip this one. And just to say that again, I think secondary prevention or what tertiary, whatever we call it, but services is also important, particularly addressing mental health, because I think the mental health link, which again, Bernadette emphasized yesterday as her second buy, is really important in terms of the impact on early childhood development, and we need to make those connections. Um, so I'll stop there, and just to emphasize that we've been hearing, I mean, we have this beautiful, nice RCT saying this works, but then, what happens when you put it into practice is a, there's a big jump. And really we need to look at how to tailor things to the situation and to the local resources, uh, you know, building the right capacities, the right skills, etc. We need to create synergies, you know, between children and, and domestic violence interventions, between um, um, interventions in the health sector with the criminal justice, as we heard this morning. So. A lot of, I think, missed opportunities to look at those synergies. We need to develop a new approach to research that doesn't rely on these RCTs. I think the suggestion yesterday to have a pipeline and, you know, have a bit of a bigger picture is uh, before you narrow down into one or two things, I think would be a helpful way of thinking about it. Um, yeah, and then, you know, make sure that services go hand in hand with prevention interventions. And political will because, uh, you know, it's tough. I mean, we have in the, in the World Health Assembly the experience of the resolution that uh, we have, which is we're very happy with and we hope will help mobilize ministries of health into action. But uh, it was tough, it was tough. There was a lot, a lot of resistance of different kinds, certainly a lot of resistance to the women's specific issues around sexual and reproductive health, gender equality, etc. A lot of resistance also around looking at issues of political violence and conflict. Uh, so the momentum is growing and we have to find a way of, of uh, building that political will and support for whatever we do to reduce violence by 50%. It would be a, a difficult task, but I think it's doable. We'll look historically, it might be. So thanks.